the reaction of your critics? Of your critics? <laughs> <laughs> Take okay. your pick. Um, <laughs> wow, thank you very much. Those are fantastic questions, which I'm not sure I'm prepared to answer <laughs> any of them, because they're real problems, right, that are faced by um, the countries that are trying to undertake this project. And you're right, I mean, I don't know if you can, can call transitional justice a cohesive or coherent project, given how many things are subsumed underneath that, that concept. And I, I mean, this isn't one of your questions, but one of your comments where you said that transitional justice is kind of potentially normatively loaded concept the way that civil society is, and even more so because it, in just the, the concept itself, it has the term justice. You know, is this really justice? Is there a normative ideal here? Is something actually being accomplished that, that falls under that term? And also, are we actually even talking about transitions anymore? You know, so both parts of the term are problematic and that, yeah, it complicates everything that falls under it. Um, so I think I would, I would tend to think that you're right that it's it's become an unwieldy, unwieldy term, um, and there is a price to the expansion. But I'm not sure that disaggregating it is not problematic as well as though the things were somehow unrelated, given that the the broader task of somehow grappling with the past and offering something resembling justice to the people who were wronged, um, it's, it's, a, it's a tough question. Uh, I think that probably in terms of the, the political prisoners associations, what falls, what, I mean, the, the part of transitional justice that they might be also, or that the project might also be termed would be compensation and recognition, but also the development of a new understanding of history Right, and that's part of where they come into conflict with uh, the more, um, I guess, by now it's a sort of standard understanding of, it, well, I shouldn't even say it's standard because it's so contested in Slovakia, but the, the academically rigorous understanding of the, the fascist state that comes in conflict with this nationalist kind of celebration of the state. Um, and all of those things are interwoven because the memorialization and the recognition feed into that renegotiation or, or redefinition of history. Um, so you can, you can accomplish the compensation monetarily and the recognition symbolically via plaques and so on, but the question of what does that mean for how they understand their own history is, is really difficult. Um, the, and I, I guess I don't, I don't really know the extent to which these groups have gotten any EU funding. They haven't necessarily gotten any push from the EU. This was a kind of a grassroots effort. But they're also, this is also complicates this civil society state relationship or dichotomy in that they're heavily funded by the state. So they actually get funds from the, the Ministry of Culture, which is, are pretty substantial, and then implicate the state. And so does the Matica Slovenska, which published that, that um, historical, uh, analysis by Bielek. Um, so it implicates, implicates the state in those projects. Um, okay, I think I'll oh, stop there and... Uh, please, hmm. Lavina, you can give your research reaction on critique. Yeah, well, great, great questions. I mean, uh, we, we can write a book on answering this, these questions, you know. My take on civil society and transitional justice is not, uh, and the fact that uh, the, the transitional justice uh, as a concept has expanded uh, that much is, uh, it's a positive trend, actually, because it's a very optimistic signal that you uh, send uh, societies. If your state is a reluctant state to re engage in uh, reckoning, then there is some scope for other actors to get in, you know? And that's my, uh, my understanding of it's messy. Yeah, I understand, yeah. Um, civil society is very messy. Some of them is, uh, um, you know, more pro or more anti, or some of them are better organized than others. But the, the real, the, the very struggle they put in to keep this uh, transitional justice uh, topic on the on the agenda, I think it's a great, great contribution they are making. Uh, when it comes to um, the EU input, uh, I think uh, John Gladhill, for now, has written the article. 
Yeah, and uh, I am convinced, as he says, uh, EU uh, input has been negligible at best. And don't start me with a big uh, project that uh, Nadia and I uh, were involved uh, with uh, with the um, uh, European Commission. It it led to, and I think uh, uh, Velo was uh, also. Uh, uh, it led to the European Commission um, to stop funding big projects on um, on uh, reckoning with both the Nazi and the uh, communist past on the idea that uh, it's too divisive for the politicians yeah uh, on diffusion uh, Helga well she's writing as we are uh, talking uh, she's writing on diffusion and on instances when um, uh, different countries in Eastern Europe because she's uh, she's limiting her discussion on uh, uh, to the to the region um, borrowed ideas or borrowed um, um, frameworks of, um, of reckoning with the past from from neighbors and sometimes when they didn't do that yeah and I, I think in Romania we have the Tisma Nanu Commission the Tisma Nanu Commission Commission was um, before the commission was uh, uh, set up. Uh, I talked to Tismananu, and uh, he acknowledged to me that he has no model whatsoever. Now I don't believe that for a moment because actually two years before Romania had the Visal Commission, yeah, the commission that uh, took um, uh, studied the, um, the Holocaust. So I don't really think you you come on a tabula rasa. Yeah, there, there is some precedent there. Um, but um, uh, what's interesting is that after the commission, ve very recently, yeah, way after the commission uh, uh, ended its um, uh, activity and reported to the president, um, Tismananu has uh, written three articles um, arguing that uh, the German commission was the model. You know, and that's rewriting your own past in a way. Yeah, that's rewriting your your own, and um, so diffusion sometimes is there, sometimes is not there. That's my uh, uh, that's my argument, and you never know how it uh, goes. Um, you know, I, I think the, the problem of multiple pasts in Eastern Europe is probably the most interesting of all. Yeah, um, and I don't know how to get away from it in a way because I mean. I understand that theoretically, uh, instead of competition, you can have collaboration and a benevolent government who would give everybody who asks for something, that's something, yeah? But in fact, transitional justice is about ranking victims. Transitional justice is about doing this, yeah? Uh, satisfying this many victims out of this many victims. Yeah, that's the political truth of it, um, because these are states, these are governments that are weak, that are uh, plagued by numerous problems, that have to take the uh, care of the business of government, and on top of that, yeah, and only at the end of that process, they are thinking about about transitional justice. They are entertaining compensation, for example. You know, so. Uh, <laughs> I don't know, you know, we, I, I think we, I, I, we need to think more about this ranking, ranking of victims, ranking of victimizers, and um, what do, you, do we do with it? Because we will never be able to satisfy everybody. Uh, you could uh, sum up, please, yeah, briefly, yeah. Yeah, your exactly. position. Uh, okay, so thank you for uh, the yeah. questions. And uh, of course, uh, yeah. Okay. Concerning the external measures uh, in the question of frustration, that's not so uh, easy, as everybody can understand for uh, clear reasons. And uh, the only successful case when such illustration list worked, it is uh, famous Magnitsky list. Yeah? And in other cases, unfortunately, also there are some other lists for some other uh, court cases which are provided. Uh, there is no success in this respect, but still, um, there, I cannot provide, unfortunately, exact statistics uh, concerning the uh, cases uh, provided to European courts of human rights, but uh, all, um, practically all political cases are successful, and uh, Russia already said that uh, 
somehow it's not going to respect European Court of Human Rights. And um, some of these cases have priority in European Court. Now, with, after the 6th May, uh, 6th of May, uh, thanks to the issue of political immigrants, who are many, uh, maybe, I mean, uh, thanks to their efforts, uh, it's somehow, the things is some, somehow moving. So they are presenting cases uh, in European Parliament sometimes, and uh, so probably it helps, but not really. Concerning the uh, organizations which are um, concerned with uh, transitional justice in uh, Russia, it's of course, uh, I, gu I guess that it's primarily NGOs also, and uh, of course, um, people who are primarily concerned with this, it is um, all uh, old Soviet, these are old Soviet dissidents, yeah, who founded, for example, Memorial, so-called, and Sakharov, Cent Sakharov, uh, Sakharov Center, so, so-called. Um, but uh, in the light of recent laws on NGOs, their work is also not so. Uh, well, can, cannot, can, cannot be so, uh, so successful. And now we face uh, propaganda, uh, state propaganda, which is, uh, uh, in fact, against uh, the work of these NGOs, which represent them as unpatriotic and so on. So that's kind of difficult. Yeah. Thank you very much. We have approximately 25 minutes for discussion, for questions and critical remarks. Please. Andrzej Kopczyński. Ja Andrzej Kopczyński. Andrzej Kopczyński. I have a question to Ms. Elena Gluszko, who was very from Poland during your round table discussions because you spoke about round table talks. Who came from Poland to attend? Reaction. Uh, your English, please. Uh, yeah. Could you trans translate? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It? I, uh, I understand. I'm sorry, I do not remember, but I will find it. I will find it. Uh, I don't have the names from Poland, but I will find it. Thank you very much. It was uh, very rich, very diverse. Uh, first, what Jelena was talking about. It's interesting how lustration can be just another name for accountability or um, uh, rule of law in the most general sense. So, it, after all, it would prove that uh, lustration is part of justice and transitional. Can be transitional, but must be part of some justice, some minimum form of justice. Uh, uh, but I had, it was fascinating to listen to the talk on civil society and the role of civil society in transitional justice. Because, of course, you can have either substantive concept that civil society is civility, values. You have to be nice if you want to be part of society, of civil society. You mustn't be a skinhead. You must be a goodie. Uh, but then you have a procedural concept of civil society when you can even handle skinheads, uh, fascists, extremists, as long as you have a genuine sense of public debate and you can confront them. It's... Um, uh, and we could, we could live with both, but my question is, what about the role of political parties, whether you count on political parties absorbing this uh, uh, political mobilization, or whether there is a risk, what Yafat said actually, that NGOs and uh, civil society models of political mobilization threaten to replace political parties and multi-party system of democracy. And I think that this is uh, uh, something from it for institutional sociology which needs to be explained to what extent this civil society and mobilization uh, within civic society then transla translating it into political programs, political parties. This is the case of Slovakia, 1998, successful mobilization against uh, autocratic uh, and quite rough government, populist government of Mečiar, but then completely disappearing and uh, today uh, you hardly have any traces of it. Um, and uh, so this is my question. Political 
parties and why juridification isn't actually juridification uh, another form of depoliticization of uh, interests emerging from civil society mm -hmm. the such question from Estonians professor please I have actually two comments to Lavinia. Uh, one concerns your um, assumption that the tribunal of 2006 in Romania was the first one in whole Eastern Europe. That's not true. There was a very similar one in Lithuania, in Vilnius, in 2000 already, which was actually transnational. So there were representatives from kind of repressed people, organizations from both Baltic states, as well as um, I think Landsbergis came there and uh, Vawansa was there as well. And that was a very similar tribunal on the crimes of communism. Um, and it had also some success and successive uh, event five years later. The other thing you said was that the EU is, is ending any kind of support for, for no. NGOs in Eastern Europe? That's also not right, because, because the actual, in, in 2020, the, the new framework uh, 2020 is, is actually more than doubling. It's going up to 18% for project funding for remembrance, including remembrance of Stalinist, Stalinist victims. So actually the money that the EU is spending on NGOs in Eastern Europe is increasing considerably. And the recognition for the importance of remembrance of the Stalinist crimes is also increasing on the institutional level. So in that sense, um, there is a realization that this is part of the common heritage and that it shows in money terms, if not in legal terms. Very good. Late, but good. <sighs> Next question from Cosme and Sebastian, please, from Romanian research. Uh, okay. Thank you very much. Uh, I think it, there are, I would pick on, on uh, Irsh's question. Um, and I, I try to turn it around a bit. Uh, in a sense in which um, I would like to, to ask all of you to, to which extent can we look at transitional justice as politics? Um, and not necessarily also in the, the process, in, in the process of juridification itself, how can we look at this process of juridification as politics proper, properly speaking? Because Lavinia showed that at some point uh, in, in her reply to, to the comments that in fact it is mainly about politics, about ranking, about choices, um, decisions. And in the same time, I would like to, to ask uh, to which extent, if politics comes into, into place here, how does it relate to, to another concept which is related, um, ideology. How ideology comes into place? Because I'm, I'm thinking, and I'm thinking here of the, the Romanian um, example. Um, of course, you have fragmentation. You have a lot of division in, in, uh, inside the uh, Romanian uh, civil society. But still, to some extent, that, that in which it is excluded from public discussions, and I mean the Holocaust to some extent, and uh, the Roma Holocaust even more, in, and this I think it, it applies also to, to some extent to Slovakia, um, I think there is some link of ideological um, relation between the state, state ideology, uh, and a diffuse ideology at the level of society. Somehow that, that you have division, you have fragmentation, but still you have some form of consensus around about things that should be silenced somehow. So. But is it ideology or ethnic identity? Uh, yeah, it, uh, uh, yes. I, I'm, I'm, I'm looking. I'm looking at yes. I'm looking at this at ideology in the sense in which. This ethnic idea, uh, uh, identity is represented uh, to people, or is represented, or is part of what is un not stated in the public discourse. It, it's still there, so, so that, that's why I call it ideology. But we can call it ethnic identity. You know, I mean, it, the way in which it enters in uh, social discourse, it's through this kind of ideological representation. You know. Okay. Thank you. Uh, I wanted to turn to Helena. I'm going to speak Russian, perhaps, or Polish or Russian. All right, perhaps Polish, because the majority of people speak Polish, not Russian. 
It is impossible to understand Russia with your mind, as a poet said. I wanted to ask you about controversial matters in relations between Poland and Russia. There is uh, a lot of articles and publica publications about that. I talked to Professor Rothfeld about that, and I wrote a review of his huge volume on the research on the subject of Polish and Russian relations. He was born in Lviv of Jewish origin, a very wise minister of foreign affairs, former minister. So I'm asking you this question. I know that you may not have the answer to my question whether, as a result of this unfavorable verdict, in Strasbourg, I'm talking about the judicial decision of the Strasbourg Tribunal about the Kassin massacre, and there is now an open Smolensk case. Do you think that in the context of these backlogs, historical backlog, which, were, which are very painful for Poland, and after last year's signing by Cyril, who was a former KGB agent, and by our Archbishop Mihalik. Do you think that after they signed the document last year, do you think that in the near future relations between Poland and Russia will improve? Do you think churches may contribute to the improvement of our relations, Orthodox and Catholic Church? or possibly opposition in Russia, like Bukowski's or Navalny's opposition. Though I know a thick publication, a thick book by called Rasia Gasudarstvo Zabojcev which is, uh, in English, let's say, uh, a state of killers. So could you please tell us from the bottom of your hearts what will happen in the future, uh, in the near future between Russia and Poland? What is your opinion about that? Okay, uh, yeah. please, please uh, Russian also... colleagues. Uh, are you going to ask a question? Yeah, uh, to Nadia. May I also ask a question to Nadia? As a... Uh, because I wanted to ask the, for, for the last panel, but I didn't have the possibility to do it. So uh, what is your opinion uh, concerning Slovakian case? What do you think about the political role of the topic of illustration in uh, uh, 1990, at the beginning of 1990? You know what I mean, the case. Mechiar, Jan Budai, that, that case, that's one question. And the other... Yeah, so what, what, is your, uh, what do you think about the political role of the subject of illustration at the first half of, uh, of uh, the year 1990? Yeah, and the second question is, um, in, what, in, in your opinion, uh, what is the role of Slovak, of this, of this perception of Slovak state, which you spoke about, in uh, the recent election of Marian Kotleba? In a nationalist, uh, this um, nationalist activist in Batsko Bistrica, for major. Thank you. Um, I thought that Yifa did a wonderful job in uh, coming up with common themes that go like a red thread through all of your presentations and the critique of Habermas' idealized notion of civil society was one such thread. And I, I would put my questions very briefly uh, and then I would like to hear from all of you. I'm fascinated by the case studies on Slovakia, Romania, on Russia. They are case studies, however, and I would like to hear in a few sentences from each of you what you learn about your case by listening to the other cases. What are, in social scientific terms, the determinants for the successful engagement of civil society in the initiation of lustration processes? Right? A comparative project can bring us closer to answers to these sorts of questions. And so far, you have all 
just only spoken about your individual cases. So if each of you could say a few sentences about what you learn about your case by listening to the other cases. Uh, I uh, want to uh, have a short notice because um, here we are saying uh, a lot of, of Slovakia. I, uh, I am working uh, at the National Institute of Slovakia 10 years and um, yes, we have some, some problems, but I think that the Nadia Nadelsky said uh, about uh, civil society and uh, some NGO but uh, when we when we saw that uh, uh, she cited uh, only some articles SME and Svedectvo but uh, in Slovakia many other media uh, informed about uh, our problems I am uh, as a responsible of uh, employees and a chairman of uh, independent Christian Christian trade union on uh, this institute. I uh, have really I have a lot of precise detailed information what we problems have to do. But I I am glad that uh, about us uh, uh, inform other people, and but I, I would like uh, uh, to inform uh, later um, by dialogue about precise information. Thanks. Thank you very. Hello. This is on. Oh. Um, thank you very much for your papers. Um, I have a question for Lavinia. Uh, <laughs> um, and thinking about questions that are also in this morning's panel, and also here on the part of the commentator and in, in your reflections, is judges and the judiciary and um, the role that the judiciary judiciary plays with respect to reckoning with the past. And it's a difficult one because you have the baggage that the judges are coming in with in terms of um, what they were socialized in, in terms of the society at the time. And then more often than not, um, many of the judicial officials were, um, in fact, collaborators. And I see in the um, Romanian experience, there's this absence, if you like, or it's interesting how you are discussing the judiciary, and I'm wondering if you could perhaps elaborate a little bit more with respect to the Romanian judiciary's role or non-role in reckoning with the past there. Thank you. Okay, you start with me. Uh, I will speak in English, okay? Because I, I don't speak in, in Polish well. Yeah, so uh, of course, uh, concerning the question of uh, relation of Poland and Russia, I, uh, uh, to, to be short, yeah, I will say that, uh, of course, the, I think we, we have to distinguish b between the relations between governments of our countries and uh, between the relations of people of our countries. In, uh, in Russia's case, it's uh, very much important to distinguish between this, yeah? So I think that um, uh, one thing, uh, I think that uh, what, I can what, I, what, what, what I can speak now, it's only about the relations uh, between Russian and Polish people. And uh, I would say that, for example, in this uh, milieu about which I'm speaking about, uh, very many people were, were uh, also surprised, as you were, by this uh, European Court's ju judgment on Katyn's case, but uh, that's also only procedural one. And 
also there are uh, so, so very, very very many people in our milieu they agree with uh, some of Polish people who blame Russian government on many uh, issues and uh, so that's it and uh, uh, in comparison uh, if, if to speak what about if to speak about comparison of Russian case and to other cases, then uh, I think that the main problem is the absence of politics in Russia and uh, violence, Slovakia, and uh, to a certain extent, in Romania, it still exists kind of institutional uh, institutional uh, fight for uh, transitional justice. Then in Russia, such uh, institutions, in fact, are not non-existent. Thank you. Thank you. Your research remarks. There are so many questions. Uh, thank you very much for them, but I don't think I'll, uh, I'll uh, have enough time to, to address all of them. Uh, three out of six uh, deal with the judiciary. Um, now, you know, there is the judiciary, which is a branch of the government, and uh, what I wanted to hint uh, uh, more was the fact that the civil society partners or actors in, involved in transitional justice in Romania have no no clue about the law yeah so it would be good to have some kind of understanding of what the heck you can indict and for what are what the what uh, reasons exactly uh, you know so uh, you'll have cases that fly in the courts yeah now the judiciary uh, in Romania is uh, similar to other countries I would say yeah they started their careers or a big chunk of them started their careers under communism um, they uh, were promoted not because uh, of great intellect or whatever but because of their obedience um, and uh, overall they have been quite opposed um, a, a moderating factor for transitional justice now, you know, the, the problem, uh, these uh, uh, questions of politics and how much politics you have in transitional justice, I, I gave an answer last, uh, year, last uh, week to AAAS, you know, and I'll uh, repeat uh, here myself. We cannot get away uh, uh, with uh, politics, yeah? Transitional justice will always take place in a politicized environment. Otherwise, we are falling on, let, uh, let uh, historians take care. Of, uh, of it, yeah? And uh, for that, you need uh, 50 years, 100 years to pass, yeah? Since the crime takes place or since the uh, regime change takes place. That's one kind of things. And, you know, I have great uh, respect for historians for what uh, they are doing. But I would say, who the heck cares <laughs> at that point? There are no victims around, there are no victimizers uh, around, and the society that was traumatized by the repression is, no, is, is different, is no longer there. So let's get used to the idea that politics will mess up transitional justice to a certain degree, yeah? And it's a matter of, again, you know, living with it and finding ways yeah, to, 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 to uh, involve the political process and the politicians, make them work towards justice, towards truth, towards reconciliation rather than against it, you know? Uh, I, uh, this might be a very um, uh, political science point, point of view because we love politics, you know? Politics is messy, but this is why it's interesting, you know? You don't, I, I don't really want to be a historian. I, I don't have anything against historians, but I don't want to spend my life in, a, in an archive where nobody in the society, when I'm, when I'm studying, really cares about my work. Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All of that. Um, okay. So uh, I guess the question about um, transitional justice or these civil society groups being overtaken by political parties. I don't know that I see that happening so much in Slovakia. Um, it's been a weak civil society since the transition has grown stronger. But one of the groups, the KPVS, has strong ties to the the Christian Democratic Party. Um, Charnogorsky is one of the leading members of it. Um, so I think there's a, you know, a healthy enough relationship 
with those particular groups that I don't see them being overtaken exactly. Um, I think transitional justice is politics. I think that it's, um, it's to the extent that it's a re <laughs> well to the extent that it's a reorientation of political norms, a reconstitution of the 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 ideology of the political community. Um, it's inherently political, and so I don't think that I mean obviously political contestation between different interests can, can complicate the situation, but I think it's a political project. Um, uh, with regard to um, the 1990s and or 1990 and Slovakia, I mean I think that there was clearly Mečiar um, having very likely had a, an STV uh, past, um, was important in the Slovak uh, basic, I mean, they didn't completely reject lustration at that point, but they didn't follow through with it, and there were enough people who were implicated, and, and uh, uh, yeah, that it was not in the interest of, of the, the party. Um, the, the recent uh, election in Banska Bistrica, I think, are you talking about the, the guy, the extremist who, from the Slovak Brotherhood or Slovak community? Um, this is a a group that um, dresses up in, in um, costumes like the Hlinka guards uh, from World War II, and this guy was recently elected, and uh, I read an article about that where um, the loser in that election, wh whose name I can't remember, said that that could have happened anywhere in Slovakia and was really feeling worried about it. So I think that the fact that somebody who represents a really radical re uh, celebration of, the, I mean, an embracing of fascism, really, um, could be elected uh, is very troubling in the context of what we're talking about here. Um, uh, and then in terms of what I learned from other cases here, uh, I think that, I mean, Lavinia's case in particular, I actually encountered something that she had written on this topic as I was doing my research, and it was one of the few places I actually found a discussion of intolerant civil society groups. So it, it was helpful to me, actually, in doing my own Analysis. Um, I haven't, like you said, I haven't found that hardly anywhere. So it was, uh, it was, it was a building block and helped me look further into my, my own investigation. Um, and I think that the the hesitation on lustration uh, is a clear um, parallel between Slovakia and Russia, though it hasn't been um, as charged an issue as, and it hasn't developed this sort of new new meaning in the Slovak context. So there's parallels and, and differences. It's not seen as expansively in Slovakia, and I think it's sort of a, a dead issue in Slovakia at this point. Thank you very much. It's not easy probably to, to discuss this problem, to actualize, to conceptualize the problematic of justice and civil society, but this discussion, it's normal. It's good discussion. Thanks for communication, for good results of the communication. Thanks for cooperation and Probably uh, tomorrow will be next panels. Okay. Thank you.